Hey, hey, War Saints, good morning. God bless and keep all of you. Welcome to St. George. We live in really confusing, strange times. Things are, things are upside down a little bit. The October issue of Playboy magazine has on the cover, the bunny is a man. TBS's hit TV show, Chad, which is a story about an immigrant little boy immigrating from Persia in the high school years, 14 years old, and the actor that plays the little boy is a woman. Things are, things are a little bit backwards. Things are upside down a little bit, where men are women and women are men. And, and it's confusing, especially for the fellas, because sometimes we get lost in, in what we're supposed to be, what we're supposed to be like. How is it to be a man? I mean... The world is, is kind of telling us different than anything that we knew to be traditional, anything we knew to be biological, anything that we just knew about what it means to be a man. And it got confusing. Enter the warrior saint. What does it mean to be a man, a full man in Christ? One must necessarily be a warrior saint. In the next coming weeks, we're going to spend some time and really define and lay out what it means to be a warrior saint and why we say that, why we use that metaphor as what we are all called to be, true men and women in Christ our God. Now, I think that there are four qualities that are specific to being truly being a warrior saint. Four qualities. A king, a knight, a mentor, and a lover. A king, a knight a mentor, and a lover. And we're going to talk about all of them in turn. Today, we're going to talk about king. To be a king is something that every man feels in his core, feels inside in the depths of his soul. He wants to be a king. And we don't necessarily need to be kings of great nations and great empires, but inside is that desire of a man to be a king and not to be soft and not to fall behind the rest of of society, to lead in his own kingdom, which starts in his heart, and then his home, and then his business, and then his community. To be a king is the first and primary desire of every man. But there is a way to do that. There's, an, there's many ways, perhaps. There's an earthly way to be a king, and then, as we'll see later, there is God's kingship. There is God's kingship. And to understand the difference between the two, we have to go all the way back to the Exodus. Now, the Exodus is a period of time we read about in the Bible where God had pulled all of his people out of Egypt because they were slaves. They were slaves in Egypt. And he, he led them through his servant Moses in the wilderness for a period of 40 years. And you all know, as desert folk, we all fully understand you can't live out there. It's impossible because there's no water. There's no shelter. There's no shade from the sun. There's nowhere to plant crops to get food. It's, it's, it's a barren wasteland. And yet God provides for his people. And he says to them in the book of Leviticus, chapter 26, this is towards the end of it, is that I'm going to be in the midst of you. Listen to these words you see here. They're going to pop on your screen. You hear from Leviticus 26. I will walk among you and, you will, and will be your God. And you shall be my people. I will walk among you. And I will be your God. You will be my people. God is saying to his people in a really weird sense, I'm going to be right in the midst of you. Right? Like understand, gods, the way that the people understood in the ancient world, they weren't like accessible. They couldn't communicate with them. They couldn't see them. They couldn't talk to them. They were like up in the heavens. Right? And God is saying, I'm going to be your king, and I'm going to be right in the midst of you, and I will take care of you, and I will provide for you. And guess what? He does. He gives them bread from the sky and water that comes out of a rock. And he sends quail so that they can have food, and he gets rid of all of their enemies. And he puts them into a promised land. And he says to them, I'm God. I will be your king. Don't be like the rest of the nations. In other words, don't be like the chaos of the world. I'm God. I got you. Right? I will take care of you and preserve you and protect you, provide for you, lead you. I will set a vision and a course for you. Just be my people and don't be like everyone else. And the people say, yay, God. And they go into the promised land and they start to live their lives. But shortly thereafter, 
we find ourselves in the book of Samuel. We're going we're to spend some time this morning in the book of Samuel. Samuel is the prophet. He is representing God to the people. And the people come to him as Samuel gets old. And, and his sons, who are going to be prophets and, and judges of Israel after Samuel dies, they're kind of wretched and kind of wicked. And we hear the following. Listen to these words from Samuel chapter 8. When Samuel became old, he made his sons judges over Israel. But his sons did not walk in his ways. They turned aside after gain. They took bribes and perverted justice. Then all of the elders of Israel gathered together and came to Samuel at Ramah and listened to these words. And they said to him, Behold, you are old and your sons do not walk in your ways. Now appoint a king to govern us like all the nations. God just said to them, I'll be your king. I got you. Don't be like the other nations. The people just said, yay, God. And then they blinked and said, we want to be like the other nations. Give us a king. And Samuel got mad. And God said, it said but Samuel, the thing displeased Samuel. And Samuel prayed to the Lord. And the Lord said, God knows what's happening here. He says to Samuel, Hearken to the voice of the people and all that they say to you, for they have not rejected you, but they have rejected me from being king. God says, Samuel, it's not about you. They have rejected me as their rightful king. I who protected and took care of them. They've rejected me. Give them a king. But before you give them a king... Tell them what it's going to be like. Oh, tribes of Israel, you want to go the route of earthly kings? Great, I'll let you have it. But here's what's coming. And then you hear the following. Listen to these words. Listen to these words from 1 Samuel chapter 8. These will be the ways of the king who will reign over you. He will take your sons and appoint them to be chariots and to be horsemen and run chariots. They're going to be your soldiers. He's going to take your sons and make them his soldiers. He will appoint for himself commanders of thousands, commanders of fifties, and some to plow his ground and reap his harvest. He's going to take your sons and make them his slaves. They will make implements of war and the equipment of chariots. They will be his blacksmiths to make his stuff. And listen, girls, you're not off the hook either. Listen to what he says. He will take your daughters to be perfumers and cooks and bakers. He will take your little girls and make them his slaves. He will take your men servants, your man servants, the best of your cattle, the best of your asses. He will take the tenth of your flocks and you will be his slaves. But in that day, you will cry out because of the king whom you have chosen yourselves. Listen to this. And the Lord will not hear you. This is what you wanted. You asked for this. This is what you get. Watch this. This is, the, this is the best book ever written, by the way. Stay with me. You're going to, there's about to be an explosion in your brain here. You asked for this. You, people of Israel, asked for a king. This is what it's going to be like. But the people, verse 19, the people refused to listen to the voice of Samuel, and they said, no, but we will have a king over us, that we also may be like the nations, and that our king may govern us and go out before us to fight Our battles. We want to be like everybody else. Give us a king. Let him fight for us. And so in the very next chapter, the first king is chosen. And his name is Saul. The people asked for it, and so God gave it to him. So that, and you heard it, so that he would govern us and fight our battles. And as the story continues, as it goes on and on, Saul does exactly what Samuel prophesied that he would. He took everything for himself and abused and crushed his people. And that whole fight the battle for us thing, it's interesting. There's a story, you know, where the tribes of Israel are fighting against the Philistines. And there's one Philistine who's really big and monstrous and scary. And his name is Goliath. And Saul, the king, runs. Some little pipsqueak David has to do the fighting for him. Saul is a picture for us of earthly, man-centered kingship. He was indeed self-ish. 
He was selfish, focused on himself and the betterment of himself. That's what earthly kings get you. When you ask for it, that's what you receive. Remember I told you your mind was going to be blown? Do you know, beloved, what the name Saul means in Hebrew? I know you don't, but I'll tell you. Do you know what it means? It means asked for. This is what you asked for. To be like the nations. To be like other men. And you got it. And with it goes Mahluba <laughs> upside down, which is why Playboy Bunnies are men and Chad is a woman. Because we ask to do things the earthly way. Now, I would not be doing my job if I left everything with doom and gloom because there's hope. There is a better way. It's God's way. And as we men who are striving to be warrior saints want to be kings, there is a better way than Saul to be the king. The king of kings, the true man, shows us how it is to live the life of a king. But he does it funny. He really does it odd, actually. Listen to these words from the Gospel of Matthew. This is what we read on Palm Sunday. As Jesus is entering the city as a king, all of his people around him, they're throwing uh, palm branches and they're celebrating. He comes in, listen to how he comes in, this most regal of kings, the king of kings, in fact. Behold, your king is coming to you. Right? That's awesome. He's entering the city. How? Humble and mounted on an ass. Totally different than Saul. Totally being sacrificial. This is, this is the son of God, people. He could fly in if he wanted to. They didn't have planes yet. And yet he comes humble and mounted on a donkey. And after the story, or as for the story of the gospel continues, we know how it ends, right? Jesus ends up as a prisoner with Pilate. And they beat him. And they mock him. And they spit on him. And they throw rocks at him. And they hit him with sticks. And they whip him and abuse him. And they put a crown of thorns. And they dress him in purple. And he's probably suffered greatly. And, and yet... Pilate does something fascinating in the Gospel of John. In chapter 19, after all this had taken place, he brings Jesus out before the people. And he says, Behold, your king. That's it. Behold, your king. In chapter 19, listen to these words. When Pilate heard these words, sorry, now it was the day of the preparation of the Passover. It was about the sixth hour. He said to the Jews, behold, your king. But the Jews rejected him and they said, crucify him, crucify him. You see, God has taken, now you want to talk about Magluba. He's taken the world's way and flipped it upside down. And that the way to true kingship, the way that we as warrior saints are called to be kings is to be Christ-like, who was not self-ish, but he was self-less, right? And that's what it means to be crucifixional. The sacrifice of self for the sake of other. You want to be a king, and I know you do, fellas, because it's in us. It's in our blood. It's in our DNA. Great. Be a good king. Be a godly king. Be a crucifixional, Christ-like king, sacrificing yourself for the sake of other. The moment it becomes about I, you're Saul, and you will get everything you asked for. On the other hand, if we change our lives and direct ourselves towards living crucifixionally, you will not be good kings in your own kingdoms. You will be great kings, men of God. So I'm going to give you three very quick, very quickly practical points that I want us, as we are striving and struggling to be kings, how do we do it? And the first thing is, in your kingdom, your, your own life, your family, if you have wives and children, your careers, your jobs, your businesses, in everything, set yourself a vision. A king always looks ahead and says, that's where we're going. If you leave it to chance, if you just walk around in the world, the world is going to give you exactly what it's giving you. You're going to be like Saul. 
Set a direction, set a destination, know where you're going, and take your family there. Pull them if you must. But set a vision, have a clear course to be godly work ethic men, godly men with a great work ethic, who strive to do the right thing in all things. The second part is, you better lead to that vision, right? I know very often gentlemen say to me, I want to have God-fearing children, but they stay home on Sundays because they work the other six days or they want to watch football. Well, your kids see it. They know. You wonder why then, why they're not God-fearing children. You know why. Lead to the vision. If you want to go there, you go first. The king is always at the front, the head of his armies. If you're at the back, it means you're not the king. And finally, you better protect that vision at all costs. Protect all parts of that vision at all costs. Look, as you are leading in a battle, you imagine the king in a battle, he has to protect the sides, the flanks, his other soldiers. He's not, though he's leading, he's not going to win the battle all by himself. He needs his team, his soldiers, his army. Likewise, we need our wives, we need our children, we need our co-workers, our bosses, and our employees. And it is our responsibility, once we have set the vision, and are leading towards that vision, to protect them so that they too can go towards that vision. To use, and I'm not a soldier, but to use that language, don't ever leave your flanks exposed. Protect your vision at all costs. Beloved in Christ, in an upside down and very confusing world, it is for real men to step up and become kings. And by so doing, we find ourselves on the path to truly being a warrior saint. And in this, you will find exactly what we are supposed to be like. May our great God and Savior Jesus Christ bless and keep you. Amen.